Today we'll be talking about chapter 13, section 1, and it's called Cultures Clash on the Prairie. We'll be talking about, yes, how the cattle industry boomed in the 1800s, but we'll also be talking about the land that we took from Native Americans, folks who were living here first, the Plains Indians. As we talk about the Great Plains, we're looking at what is today Kansas, Texas, even the flat parts of Colorado, everything east of the Rockies, west of the Mississippi, a huge chunk of land that takes about two days to drive across. There were many people living out there before we came to this area, and those are the folks that we're going to begin talking about. And so, first, I wanted to help you understand how important this area is. The Great Plains is the entire west central portion of the United States. Everything west of the Mississippi, east of the Rocky Mountains. It's a place with a beauty of its own. I drive through it every year. I love it. I think it's fascinating to see just how large this area is. There were many people living there. There were many buffalo, as you can see in this clip. Millions. There were once more buffalo than there were people on this continent. Sea of these large animals. Again, hundreds of millions. Now, they're on the endangered species list. We nearly wiped them out. There were people who made their entire way of life off of these buffalo that you can see. The Sioux were the largest of these people. But there were many. The Comanche, the Apache. Many, many western tribes. The Cheyenne. Did you know you're named after a tribe? Yeah. Yeah. So these people made their life off of what they had. They were often nomadic because buffalo travel. They migrate from place to place. And many of these people were nomadic as a result. They didn't own the land. They dwelt upon it. However, different tribes over the thousands of years they'd lived here had come to lay claim to certain hunting lands. They had fought wars just like we had over these lands and they had laid claim to them for many, many years. But the buffalo could provide many basic necessities. Hide could become clothing or shelter. The meat could obviously be staple food, sinew for rope, bones for structures and medicine. Everything was used. This is what a buffalo looks like. Maybe you've seen one, maybe you haven't. Thankfully they are making a comeback. We have recently taken them off of the endangered species list, but they are still a protected species. By the end of the 1800s, there were less than 1,000 of these creatures left on the planet. From hundreds of millions to near extinction. These animals provided a way of life for most people living in the Great Plains of what is today the United States. How did these people live? Most nomadic peoples live in what we call a stateless society, meaning no formal government. They are nomadic. They typically dwell in tribes, which is why we talk about the Sioux tribe, the Cheyenne tribe, the Arapaho, Apache, etc. These tribes evolve in natural ways from family groups that speak the same language. They spend enough time together that over generations they develop a language of their own. Most of their faiths, their religions, center around a blend of animism, of spirits. These people were living in a way 
that many Europeans had not seen for thousands of years. Their culture had remained relatively unchanged for thousands of years. And it's fascinating. They worshiped the sky, the earth, the wind, the spirits. This is again called animism. <coughs> Children learn through an oral tradition, through stories or myths passed down through the generations. Life itself was communal. The tribes shared everything. People filled specific roles of warrior or hunter or gatherer or builder. Again, this is the old way. Many of these tribes, again, were nomadic by nature. And so, of course, they had no understanding or concept of land ownership. Those customs came with farming and settlement, which, yes, had evolved in Western Europe perhaps thousands of years ago. But on the plains of what is today the United States, there had never been a need to de develop farming societies. Yes, there were farming civilizations in the United States prior to Columbus. The Eastern Woodland Indians, the Cherokee people had all been using farming for many, many years. But the Plains Indians, no. The buffalo were so plentiful, they didn't need it. It provided everything they needed for their way of life. And so when European settlers moved west, with our culture of staking our claim and land ownership, many didn't consider these rights of dwelling that the natives held sacred because they didn't have a document to prove it. And so as migrants moved west, they claimed it. They said, this is mine. I have a piece of paper to prove it. Settlement really began to increase with the discovery of gold in 1858 in Colorado. Colorado is a beautiful place. You've got to go see it. I've spent four summers there. I've explored most of it, but it's so big, I, can't, I don't know if I'll ever see all of it. Someday I hope to climb all the 14,000 foot peaks. I've done about six of them but there's too many, and most of them are too dangerous. But it's an amazing place. It's beautiful. Some of the biggest rivers I've ever been on are in Colorado. And it's just an amazing place. If you paddle through the Royal Gorge of the Arkansas, you'll be on some of the biggest rapids you've ever seen through canyon walls thousands of feet tall with no escape. But as you pass through this canyon called the Royal Gorge because it's just majestic, you'll also see an old gold mine deep in the middle of this canyon. Wow, how did it get there? It's kind of cool to see. And there's this little narrow gauge track. I just keep thinking like how on earth did these trains make it through this canyon without falling into the river? They probably did. Um, there are probably constant landslides because it's a really unstable region, too. There are mines like that everywhere. You know, this summer, I got to see Silverton, a really beautiful town in Colorado. The elevation of this town is about 9,000 feet. You know, that's high enough that if you run and you're not acclimated, you'll pass out. Well, I put onto a river there called the Animus River. 26 miles of continuous class four and five whitewater. It was just beautiful to see. It was amazing. But again, there's a train that runs by the entire river. The train was built to mine. Silverton is called Silverton because silver was discovered there and it was being mined out of Colorado. And there were places, many places like that. Because you see, when gold was discovered, just like in California, it brought people to the region. Well, these mining camps, if you go and see them, were filthy. 
They're a mess. Maybe someday you'll get to go up to Mount Quandry. You should see it. It's a 14,000 foot peak in Colorado. You can drive up to 12,000 feet. I spent a scary night in high winds at 12,000 feet sleeping in my car hoping it wouldn't blow over. Climbed the mountain. The wind knocked me off my feet. Strong gust of wind. I eventually had to back down. It was too scary. Somehow at the very top, there's a mine. I was like, how on earth did this thing get up there? It's there. Trust me. I took pictures of it. Well, it's a mess. There's junk everywhere, even still over a hundred years later. And it brought people from all over the world to these places. I almost forgot to mention, most of these people were men. Did you know that the western states were the first states to allow women to vote? Wyoming, the very first state to allow women to vote. Why? Well, the ratio of men to women was dismal. You know, I always wondered if it was just a way to try to encourage women to move out west. <laughs> like, hey, come here, it's just a bunch of dudes. But we'll let you vote. Uh, and so there's, there's never been as a degree of misogyny out west as there perhaps has been here. But now, in 1834, the United States government designated the Great Plains as one huge reservation. Yes, the Great Plains were seen as the province of the natives. That means Kansas, that means Oklahoma, that means the, west, the eastern parts of Colorado. That means everything. Texas. These are all to be a sacred place. And that was 1834. However, as more and more people began to move out west and began to lay claim, we started saying, no, actually, the Dakotas belong to the Sioux. No way to actually, the Cheyenne need to live around Sand Creek. No way to actually, no way to actually. <laughs> we began to go back on our word because it was convenient. The reason I mentioned Sand Creek was it was the site of the very first massacre of Native Americans out west. 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho were camping at Sand Creek for the winter. It's common practice. They would stay there. Then they would migrate with buffalo in the spring. Well, the problem was this winter camp at Sand Creek was near the location of an American settlement. And there had been violence between the natives there and the settlers as tensions arose when the settlers attempted to claim this land as their own. And so the United States Army came in and killed everyone they saw. As you know, this isn't the first case of violence of Americans versus natives, but many of these stories like this are tragic. Many of these Cheyenne and Arapaho were unarmed men, women, and children. The next case was in the Dakotas. There was a migration route, kind of a common path that settlers traveled upon, called the Bozeman Trail. Well, the problem with this is the Bozeman Trail crossed right through the Sioux hunting grounds. And even though they didn't have a document claiming this is their territory, this is where the buffalo lived during the summer months. And if settlers pass right through the area, or heaven forbid we build a railroad right through the area, well, we're going to scare all the buffalo away. And the point that the Sioux were trying to make when Red Cloud actually went to the United States government and attempted to peacefully petition that we stop settlements in this region was, look, if 
you keep passing through and you either scare the buffalo off or kill them, you might as well be killing us. We can't live with this. And so the Treaty of Fort Laramie was passed. The United States closed the trail. We claimed, designated the Dakotas as one huge reservation. Now there was one famous chief. I'm sure you've heard his name before. He actually refused to sign this treaty. He said, I don't trust these people. I mean, by this point, Word had spread of the massacre at Sand Creek. By this point, most natives were aware of the Indian Removal Act. They weren't stupid. Sitting Bull certainly wasn't stupid. He wouldn't sign the Treaty of Fort Laramie. And he was actually the leader of the Hunk Papa Sioux. The Sioux were one of the largest tribes of Native Americans in the North Plains, in the North Country region. They were so large, in fact, there were factions within the tribe. He was the leader of one of these factions, the Hump Papa. In 1868, the Red River War began. The Kiowa and the Comanche had made a living raiding and looting caravans as they passed west. attacking United States settlements that were encroaching upon their borders. The United States government responded by hunting these people like savages and crushing any resistance they saw. This was known as the Red River War. General George Armstrong Custer of the 7th Cavalry was tasked with serving as a peacekeeping force to prevent settlers from moving into the Dakotas. Remember the Treaty of Fort Laramie said the Dakotas belonged to the Sioux. And it was his job to keep people out. However, instead of doing his job he allowed miners and prospectors to go into the Black Hills of Dakota. And they found gold. And they found a lot of gold in this region. And instead of protecting the natives, as was his job, he began to sell plots of land on their territory. He had a pretty decent side business going selling off mining rights in the Black Hills that belonged to the Sioux. And he was actually facilitating a gold rush. Sitting Bull was right all along. Now, I wonder how many of his own people had told him to make peace, to try to live at peace. And I wonder how many people thought he was crazy when he was like, I don't trust these folks. He was exactly right. This perhaps is one of the more glorious moments for the natives in their long defeat. The Sioux lured Custer and his men into a box canyon. There aren't too many box canyons in the southeast. You gotta really go into the sticks to find them. There's one on the Whitewater River in Sapphire, North Carolina. You better be good with a map and a GPS. It's quite an undertaking to go find it, but it's there. It's a box canyon. If you go and see it, I still haven't made my way in there, but I've seen lots of video and picture. But if you go in there, there's one way in, there's one way out. There's a handful of places like that around here, but not many. But one reason that one way in, one way out concerns me a little bit is because of Box Canyons, because of Custer's story. He chased a handful of natives into this Box Canyon, and in this case, you have to see it. It's a big U. There's one way in, there's one way out. And then 
In true dramatic fashion, 3,000 Sioux warriors show up on the ridge. And they cut off the exit. And they surround Custer and his men. And they kill every one of them. Now, that's Custer's famous last stand. After this famous battle, the Sioux were defeated eventually. Most were forced to either surrender or flee into Canada. Sitting Bull was forced to surrender in 1881. In 1881, Helen Hunt wrote, Helen Hunt Jackson wrote an expose called A Century of Dishonor. She represented the minority opinion in the United States that what we were doing was wrong. And while I'm proud to point out there were folks who believed that back then, most didn't care. It was the policy of the United States government to encourage or facilitate assimilation. We wanted the natives to begin farming, to begin living as we did. In fact, with passage of the Dawes Act in 1887, we required they do this. We told them to give up their way of life, to live on plots of land that we designated. And essentially what this allowed was we took two thirds of their land and we divided up the other third among family-sized plots belonging to the natives. And they received no compensation for this until much later. There's the book. It's on my shelf if you want to borrow it. It's just called The Century of Dishonor, the classic expose of Native Americans. But as we were talking about, perhaps the most tragic thing we have to understand is that the buffalo were destroyed. Went from a population of hundreds of millions to almost none. So, today I'd like to talk about the largest mass shooting in American history. And no, I'm not talking about the recent events in L.A., though those were certainly tragic. 120 people lost their lives to a single shooter. Yeah, the, the L.A. shooting, yeah. Wait, it wasn't 120, it was, was it 57? 59, yeah, sorry, I had that wrong. Um, yeah, so 59 people lost their lives, many more wounded. Uh, it's been called the worst mass shooting in recent American history and perhaps the worst shooting in American history is this known as the Battle of Wounded Knee. And um, as I said, Sitting Bull was arrested in 1881. He refused to be taken prisoner indefinitely and tried to escape and he was killed uh, when police attempted to arrest him. The 7th Cavalry was sent to round up the Sioux for relocation and a shot rang out, and I'll go ahead and show it to you. And it resulted in the deaths of about 300 men, women, and children, mostly unarmed. All right. And so we're going to get into talking about cowboys and cowboy culture. Um, but first off, Got a neat little activity for you guys. So, the myth of the cowboy, as you know, is much bigger than even perhaps the reality. 
to be fair, this, this tradition of driving cattle from the open range into a town where they can be processed and made into beef is an old tradition. Uh, Mexican settlers had been doing this for many years. In fact, uh, vaqueros had long been a part of Mexican culture, and we learned this way of life from them. Uh, in fact, the very way we, that cowboys dressed was borrowed from vaqueros. The very way cowboys spoke, um, the way they lived on the go. Again, most of those uh, cultures were borrowed from Mexican settlers. Uh, cowboys weren't really in demand until railroads, that is, in, in the United States, that is, until railroads made their way out west, where uh, cowboys could drive their herds of cattle to the nearest railroad town. Um, but after the Civil War, as our population was growing due to immigration, um, there was a greater demand for beef. And as we now had access to all of these open spaces where cows could um, be allowed to graze openly, um, there was a brief period of history where, um, you know, the long drive and the open grazing was very common. One of the things that made this possible was the cow town. You know, where shipping yards and rail lines would meet and where cowboys would bring their cattle that had been grazing on the open range to these towns to be loaded up on trains and brought back to packing cities such as Chicago. So one of the major cattle routes was called the Chisholm Trail. It came from San Antonio, Texas, all the way up through Kansas, which Kansas is huge if you've never been. I've actually passed through this area. Um, Maybe I'll think to show you some pictures. Some. But day in the life of a cowboy. Um, the real heyday of this was between 1866 and 1885. So less than 20 years. Where there were about 55,000 cowboys on the plains where open grazing was very common. But did you know that American cowboys, and Bailey was exactly right, um, were a quarter African American. Many of them were Hispanic. And so really, you know, the West was kind of a neat place where folks were mixing and moving out here for all the same reasons. The hours were long. The days were hard. You had to be good on a horse. You had to be great with ropes. And you had to be pretty smart to live out in the wild like that, otherwise you just wouldn't last long. Every spring, cattle would be rounded up, cowboys would have to go out and find strays. So open grazing means that the herd of cattle worked just like the buffalo. They were essentially set free to find food for themselves. And then they'd be rounded up, cowboys would go out and find them, and then they would migrate the whole herd into town together. This sounds rather chaotic, and really it is. I mean, you basically set an entire herd of cattle free, and then every spring you've got to go round up the entire herd, and you've got to get them to move in one direction. <coughs> it's not a simple job. So to designate whose cows belong to whom, they would brand them because if herds are gonna openly graze, they're gonna mix and they'll be all mixed up and so they would brand them to uh, mark their ownership. So this painting's pretty neat. It's called Riders in the Storm. But the long drive itself might take as much as three months. During this time, cowboys would be in the saddle all day, dawn till dusk. They'd sleep on the ground, they'd have to bathe in the rivers. It's a rough way of life. But it's led to so many legends in our culture. I don't know if you've ever heard of the cowboy celebrity, Wild Bill Hickok. He staged the, buff the, um, the Wild Bill show. Uh, what was it called? The Buffalo Bill show. Uh, it was a cowboy show. He traveled the country like a circus. And he would put on this show and he had real... 
Sioux Warriors versus real cowboys, and they would uh, stage mock battles and entertain the crowd. Uh, you know, famous celebrities like Wild Bill or Calamity Jane, common performers. But now, the cowboy era came to an end due to a number of reasons. Partially overgrazing. You know, you let these cows free, they just eat whatever, wherever. And as the population of the West began to increase, no one wants a herd of cattle going through their farm because they're going to eat everything in your farm. And so ranchers tended to use barbed wire to fence in their farms to keep cattle off. Barbed wire was becoming cost effective due to techniques that we'll talk about soon. And because of that, the public land where cows could graze was growing smaller and smaller. And so now if you go out west, you'll see huge ranches, some the size of Henderson County. In fact, many the size of Henderson County, huge things, exits all their cell. But they're fenced off. Keep the cows out, and it's practical but it also contributed to the end of the cowboy era. So today we'll be talking about chapter 13, section two, talking about settling on the Great Plains. What was life like for these individuals who moved out to the Great Plains? Uh, what were some hardships they experienced? And how did the land change as a result of these rapid population growths? So as we talk about settlement, one of the biggest changes that I forgot to mention was the railroads. The major technological improvement that is going to improve folks' ability to get out to these places. I mean, yes, settlers were moving as far as Oregon long before the railroad, but these journeys were perilous. People died along the way. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the Donner Party. Uh, oh, yeah. Many people didn't make it. And many more were discouraged from even trying. Many more were discouraged from even trying to make the journey because it was so perilous, it was so difficult. Uh, but railroads are going to make this possible. It's going to make it easy. You buy a ticket, in a few days, you are safely and comfortably in a new place. And in the 1860s, the major infrastructure project going on in our country was the building of railroads, in particular transcontinental <coughs> railroads. By the 1880s, there were five of these, five railroad tracks stretching across the entire country, connecting the east and the west coast. This is going to attract people to be able to move for the first time. You can buy a ticket and you can ride a train anywhere you want to go in the country. That is generally. I mean, you still have to migrate somewhat, but towns and cities are going to grow along these railroads. Railroads are now the new real estate developers selling land to farmers and uh, are going to attract many people to come into the area because, number one, transportation requires a large labor force. And so immigrants are going to come in, particularly from China, but from all over the world to work on these things. Now also in 1862, a law was passed, a very important law called the Homestead Act. Any person may receive 160 free acres of land. Any person who so desired may receive 160 acres of free land. There were a few qualifications. You had to be the head of a household, generally a male, and you had to be willing to live on this land. You didn't just to get a piece of paper saying you have land in Nebraska. No, you have to go move to Nebraska to receive this land. But during the heyday of the Homestead Act, up through about 1900, 600,000 families took advantage of this opportunity, receiving free land, and this helped to develop the West. Many of these people were exodusters, that is, African Americans leaving the Southeast for a number of reasons and moved to places like Kansas or Nebraska 
or various other territories that were rapidly growing in population. Now, there was a share of corruption. I mean, railroads were profiting from this, taking advantage of these people. Uh, plenty of folks were speculating, that is, hiring someone to go and live on this land to wait it out until that land became more valuable. Uh, in reality, of the Great Plains, where the Homestead Act applied, only about 10% of this land actually went to families. The rest was gobbled up by speculators who profited from this, or from railroads who were selling this, again, for a profit. Um, but the bottom line is around 600,000 people qualified and were able to start new lives thanks to the Homestead Act. Um, by 1872, everywhere in the lower 48 had been seen by someone. There were no more frontiers. There was no more unexplored territory. Yellowstone National Park was the first of its kind, the first national park created to protect wilderness areas. Uh, but yet by 1890 again, all lands had been explored by someone. But yet, the frontier has remained an important part of American culture. We are a people of explorers. We are a people of adventurers. So, you've hit the jackpot. You and your family have qualified for the Homestead Act, and you have now received your 160 acres of free land on the Kansas prairies. Congratulations. You really got to go out there and see it sometime. And aside from the handful of towns that you pass through and a couple of large cities, it's pretty empty. It's pretty flat. And you often go hours, or if you were walking or riding horse, days without seeing so much as a tree. So congratulations, you're a piece of land has no trees. There's a railroad, but if you want to buy lumber, you're talking about a very expensive price tag on that lumber. You're probably not going to be able to afford it. So a lot of first generation homesteaders would build their homes from what they had on the land. And the most abundant building material on the land was sod. No one had lived or developed permanent dwellings in much of the Kansas Territory ever. And so eons of grass rotting on top of grass rotting had developed a very thick sod, a layer that can be cut into bricks and you can build things out of it. And that's exactly what they did. And so many people wound up living in sod homes until they could afford to buy the lumber they needed for their homes. Many of these homesteaders were virtually alone. I mean, this is like a little house on the prairie lifestyle, where people were living in very traditional roles. Uh, families were having to work together to survive, men and women cooperating together. In fact, Western states often tend to be more progressive than do Eastern states because they have developed this culture of cooperation out of necessity. In fact, it was the western states that, uh, for example, um, first allowed women to vote. It was the western states where many men and women were working equally side by side. Uh, but communities did develop as towns grew. But this part of our country is still a very wide open and empty part of our country because it is sparsely populated. But as we talked about in the bell ringer, new technologies allowed for mass production of agricultural goods. And this is actually going to help farming become more viable. 
Farming has come a long way throughout our history. There's a science to it. You can major in it. You can study it at this very school. You can take agricultural classes and learn the science of managing domesticated animals or the science of cultivating crops for profit. And there's even a business side as well. There's a lot to farming. The Morrill Act, first passed in 1862 and strengthened in 1890, provided finances for agricultural schools to develop. And while, yes, you can learn the science of farming in a classroom, there's also a practical side. And so in 1887, the Hatch Act created agricultural experiment stations, for example, uh, learning farms where you can go and practice farming and you can work and you can get an internship and you can learn everything there is to know because a lot of the skills required to be a successful farmer are learned at the farm. But these mechanical reapers, these steel plows, the timber to build these farm homes come at a great cost. And while if you drive through Kansas or the eastern parts of Colorado or even the Missouri territories, you'll see huge farms, an entire day's worth of driving and seeing nothing but farms and maybe a city or two. It's, it's incredible. Many of these farms are the size of counties. Huge operations multi-million dollar businesses. These are called Bonanza Farms. Often dedicated to the growth of a single crop. These often employ large labor forces and they operate and function just like a corporation. Some of these single crop operations went completely bankrupt. Uh, throughout the 1890s because of economic problems. For example, when uh, shipment costs increased, farmers often wound up in debt. Um, farming can diversify. It can be a successful and predictable business, uh, but it does often function and rely on many factors to be successful, and one of those is transportation cost. When the price of gas goes up, the price of groceries goes up. The two go hand in hand because farmers rely on transportation to get their goods to market. Today we'll be finishing up our discussion of chapter 13 with section 3 and it's called Farmers and the Populist Movement. And we're going to be talking today about how farmers united to address common economic problems. And this gave rise to a new political party called the Populist Party. In the summer of 1963, a high school teacher changed the way the world looked at the Wizard of Oz. His name was Henry Littlefield, and he was teaching an American history class. He'd made it to the late 19th century, a time called the Gilded Age. But he was struggling to keep his class interested in the complex social and economic issues of the time. Then one night, while he was reading The Wonderful Wizard of Oz to his daughters, he had an idea. In the 1890s, farmers wanted to add silver to the gold standard to put more money in circulation and make it easier for farmers to borrow. In the book, Dorothy walked to the Emerald City on the yellow brick road in her silver shoes. The movie's ruby red slippers started out as silver. Silver and Gold on the Road to Prosperity. L. Frank Baum had published the book in 1900 at the height of the Gilded Age, and the analogy didn't seem out of the question. No one else had seen these connections, but that didn't deter Littlefield. He taught his class about the Gilded Age using the book, and soon he and his students were finding more connections 
For instance, in the late 1890s, the U.S. had recently recovered from the Civil War and integrated vast new territories, bringing an era of prosperity for some. But while industry and finance in the North and East prospered, farmers across the South and Midwest struggled. This led to the populist movement, uniting farmers and workers against urban elites. By 1896, the movement had grown into the People's Party, and its support of Democrat William Jennings Bryan put him in reach of the presidency. Meanwhile in Oz, claimed Littlefield, Dorothy is a typical American girl whose hard life in Kansas is literally turned upside down by powerful forces outside her control. The Munchkins are the common people oppressed by the Witch of the East, banks and monopolies. The Scarecrow is the farmer, considered naive but actually quite resourceful. The Tin Woodman is the industrial worker, dehumanized by factory labor. And the Cowardly Lion is William Jennings Bryan, who could be an influential figure if only he were brave enough to adopt the populists' radical program. Together, they travel along a golden yellow road towards a grand city whose ruler's power turns out to be built on illusions. Littlefield published some of these observations in an essay. His claim that this fantasy was actually a subversive critique of American capitalism appealed to many people in the 1960s. Other scholars took up the theme, and the proposed analogies and connections multiplied. They suggested that Dorothy's dog Toto represented the teetotalers of the Prohibition Party. Oz was clearly the abbreviation for ounces, an important unit in the silver debate. The list goes on. By the 1980s, this understanding of the book was accepted so widely that several American history textbooks mentioned it in discussions of late 19th century politics. But is the theory right? L. Frank Baum's introduction claims the book is just an innocent children's story. Could he have been deliberately throwing people off the trail? And is it fair to second-guess him so many decades later? There's no definitive answer, which is part of why authorial intent is a complex, tangled, fun question to unravel. And some recent scholars have interpreted The Wonderful Wizard of Oz in the opposite way as Littlefield. They claim it's a celebration of the new urban consumer culture. Historian William Leach argued that the dazzling Emerald City of Oz was meant to acclimate people to the shiny new America. In the end, all we know for sure is that Baum, inspired by European folk legends, had set out to create one for American children. And whether or not he intended any hidden meanings, its continuing relevance suggests he succeeded in creating a fairy tale America can call its own. So, there were many common problems that faced farmers all throughout the country. For example, um, most farmers nationwide had a large degree of debt for several reasons. Number one, to increase revenue, you needed more land, you needed more tools, you needed more workers. And farmers found themselves in a vulnerable position. For example, after the Civil War, um, the government during the war had stimulated the economy by boosting the supply of money through the creation of a currency called greenbacks. That is, a type of paper currency that had no gold or precious metals to back it up. Well, after the war, the government took those out of start circulation. And what that means is that farmers who owed money, which are most farmers, really most poor people have some degree of debt, myself included, we found ourselves having to pay more money than what we actually owed. Because the money that we had borrowed was worth less than the current value of money. So that's called deflation. 
That means the value of currency goes up. That helps you if you have money, that hurts you if you owe money. Second problem that faced all farmers. The price of crops fell dramatically. That is because the supply of crops rose dramatically. I mean, there's going to be an economic windfall from 600,000 new farms being established. That's a huge boost in the supply of agricultural products. So in the 1870s, farmers began to unite, began to lobby the government to push more money back into circulation. And this did result in the passage of the Bland-Allison Act. Um, it was a small increase in the supply of money, but it really wasn't enough. Another common problem that farmers faced were the railroads. The railroads in Frank Baum's story are often represented by one of the wicked witches. And there's a reason for this. You see, in the 1880s, there were only five transcontinental railroads, five companies in the country. And I'd be willing to bet that many of these railroads were owned by the same companies. That means only a handful of companies in the entire country <clears throat> were transporting goods for farmers out west. That means options were limited. Competition was non-existent. And so railroads could charge whatever they wanted for shipping. Yeah, I mean, railroads would commonly take advantage of farmers. Why? Because they were a captive market. They had to buy from the railroads. And so the railroads could charge them whatever they wanted. It's very similar to the EpiPen controversy that you guys have heard about, I'm sure. Right now, EpiPens are sold by one manufacturer. 
the maker of EpiPens, a life-saving medicine for someone who has a severe allergic reaction, those EpiPens just went up dramatically in price. But you got to have it. It's life or death if you don't and you have a severe allergy. You will die without that medicine. And so people have to pay that price. They have no choice. Farmers are in the same situation. They have to sell their crops. It's how they make a living. It's how they survive. No matter what the railroads charge them for shipping, the farmers have to pay it. Also, as we talked about, farmers were having to borrow money to buy supplies and suppliers of these goods were charging extremely high interest rates. It became very difficult to make a living as a farmer. And so farmers organized. In 1867, Oliver Hudson Kelly started the Patrons of Husbandry, popularly known as the Grange. The purpose of this was to be a social organization, a union to educate farmers about problems they were facing, to educate farmers about the common problems they were facing, like the quote you saw, that regardless of race, if you're in farming, you're being taken advantage of, and that the railroads were using the issue of race to make people fight amongst themselves so that they wouldn't think about the real problem. Divide and conquer. So the Grange began forming farmers alliances. These were groups of farmers and people sympathetic to their cause. They traveled the country and began to try to educate people about one of the real problems facing our country that the poor are being taken advantage of. They gained four million members in the 1890s. In fact, they had enough people to create a political party. The slogan of the United Farm Workers was United we stand, divided we fall. But the combined forces of united labor will prove invincible in their onslaught. That if the people can come together, we can accomplish a great deal. This movement is known as populism. Populism is defined as a movement of the people, of the common person. And they made as their platform several reforms. For example, in regards to the economy, one of the number one goals was to increase the money supply through the introduction of a bimetal currency, a currency backed not only by gold but also by silver and that's why Dorothy's shoes allegedly were silver before the movie. Also a graduated income tax. 
I don't know if you've heard, if you follow politics closely, maybe you've heard that one party favors a flat income tax that everyone pays 10% of their income. And maybe that sounds fair in theory. But did you know that 10% of your income hits you a lot more dearly than 10% of a wealthy person's income? That you spend a higher portion of your income on non-discretionary items like groceries. So 10% hits you a lot harder than 10% would hit a wealthy person. The graduated income tax is now known as the law of the land, but it was once a theory called radical and revolutionary because the populace brought it up. And then finally, federal loans for farmers. Federal loans for poor people. I have my house today because of a federal loan that once was considered radical by the populist. I'd still be renting were that not the case. In regards to politics, did you know that the U.S. Senate was once not elected by the people? They were appointed from amongst themselves. It's from an old tradition when Britain created the Parliament. The Senate was once called the House of Lords. They represented the nobility, not the common people. Now we elect our senators through the 17th Amendment. That was once considered radical. The secret ballot, when it was proposed, now we take for granted that you do not have to disclose who you voted for. It is your right to tell people or not to. Again, once considered radical. Lastly, in regards to politics, the eight hour workday. Yes, did you know that when you get to clock out at five o'clock or after eight hours, whatever your shift is, thank a populist. Hmm. Okay, now, in 1892, populist candidates had embedded themselves at different levels of government. Now, the Populist Party, as you'll see, eventually declined, but eventually the Democratic Party adopted this platform, championed this platform, and has been working for it ever since. Now, in the Panic of 1893, back to monopolies, because of poor business practices, such as expanding faster than their actual ability to do so, uh, many railroads began to go bankrupt. I don't know if you followed the recession, you guys were very young when it started in 2008, but there was a problem. Many of the large banks like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac some of the largest banks in our country almost collapsed. And there was a discussion about what we should do. Because the problem was these banks were too big to fail. If they collapsed, our currency system would go with it. Our country could have entered a more severe Great Depression than what we went through in the 1930s. If these handful of companies had gone bankrupt, why did they go bankrupt? It's complicated. There's a great movie about it called The Big Short if you really want to understand why they went bankrupt. But the problem is we had to bail out these banks because if we didn't, the alternative was financial collapse. And that happened in 1893 as well. When these railroads were on the verge of collapse and some did go bankrupt, there was a depression. There was a financial collapse. And really, looking back to 1893 is why we elected to bail out these banks in 2008. Now, <clears throat> what we also need to understand is that there are political divisions in our country. There was then, there are now, 
And these political divisions are often regional, and it's been that way forever. In the Northeast, the Republican base was made generally of Northeastern business owners, the wealthy, who owned a great deal of power and influence, and bankers as well. The Democratic Party generally represented the southern region of our country, as we talked about in Reconstruction, but also came to represent farmers in the West and the common person. And so the populist merged and joined forces with the Democratic Party over these economic issues. And one of their chief concerns was bimetallism. And that is a financial system that would use not only gold to back it, but also silver. This would allow for an increase in the money supply. That is what we call a stimulus. Meanwhile, the gold bugs, as they called themselves, the Republican Party wanted only currency to be only backed by gold. And in fact, if you're a libertarian, you probably believe in the gold standard still. That is still something that many people favor. The idea with both theories was that paper money is worthless if it can't be exchanged for its value in precious metals. But again, bimetallism would stimulate the economy, according to their theory. Now, William Jennings Bryan represented in the story by the cowardly lion, ran for president in 1896. He was the Democratic candidate, endorsed by the Populist Party. He personified this idea of championing the cause of the poor. He delivered a famous speech called the Cross of Gold speech where he said that mankind is being crucified on a cross of gold. That the gold standard favors the wealthy, hurts the poor, and those in power are using divisiveness to distract you from what they are trying to accomplish. The wool is over your eyes. And the election became this idea of the poor versus the wealthy. William McKinley was the Republican nominee for president versus William Jennings Bryan. And the two began a national debate on economic issues. What Bryan was trying to and what the Democratic Party really became after this point was a party of economic reform. In fact, candidate after candidate from Bryan all the way to Truman decided to step away from social issues to focus instead on economic issues. So here's a political cartoon. I mean, people made fun of him all day long for this. You know, he was the Bernie Sanders of his time, if you will. You know, they called him communist, socialist, old crazy lunatic. Why? Because he suggested such radical things as an eight-hour workday. Such radical things as a graduated income tax. Such communist ideas as the direct election of senators. Again, he was seen as a radical, and he was portrayed 
as a loony. While the election represented some very interesting discussions on real economic issues that affected us all, the election itself played out like most elections of this time. The Republicans cleaned up the Northeast. The Midwest went for Brian, as well as the South, as well as farmers. But here's the thing, the Northeastern states have such a higher population than do the Southerners and do these Western states that even in the Electoral College, McKinley won. He realized he didn't need those states, that he needed the support of these wealthy business owners who could guarantee the support of their workers. And we'll talk about how corrupt that is and how twisted that is later. Even though McKinley won, even though he didn't need the poor to win this election, this election represents several neat things. Number one, that the poor can organize and can show real power without having to <clears throat> use a guillotine and kill all the rich people. They don't have to have a French Revolution. We can have a peaceful revolution of the people. But also, their ideas are now taken for granted as something that you and I expect, that we believe we deserve. People died so that you can have the right to vote for your senator. People died so that you can have an eight-hour workday, a minimum wage, a safe place to work. It's part of the labor movement that we'll be talking about soon. 